would like to welcome Professor uh, Abdullah Schleifer, the director of Kamal Adham Television Center or uh, Kamal Adham Center for Television Journalism. Welcome to our program. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you very much. It's our pleasure. And the first question is, uh, of course, our issue today is the uh, Arabs and Muslims image in the Western media. Mm -hmm. Our question is, in your opinion, how this negative image was created? Well, you know, it's, it's really not such a simple thing to talk about. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. In the United States, first of all, you have, by West, we have to separate Europe from America. And they're very contrary experiences. Mm. In the United States, up until the mid-40s, you know, late 40s, yes. late 40s, early 50s, you did not have a negative image of either Arabs or Muslims. Quite on the contrary. Many of the Hollywood movies that were made in the 1920s and 30s had the, uh, the Arab as a romantic figure. For instance, the most romantic star, the leading star of Hollywood movies, Rudolph Valentino, who was very famous for some movies he made in which he played a, a uh, Bedouin sheikh, who was a hero. He was brave, he was romantic, uh, he was honorable, he was chivalrous. Uh, so there was no, and I think the reason for that is that you have to understand that the United States did not exist at the time of the Crusades. Mm -hmm. It didn't even exist at the time when the Ottoman Empire, you know, it was only 300 years ago, a little more than 300 years ago, that you had Muslims armies besieging Vienna, uh, in charge of the Balkans and besieging Vienna. In other words, uh, the, the Ottomans were a very powerful uh, army that marched across, conquered in the Balkans, were threatening Vienna. Vienna was under siege two or three times. America didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So in America, there was no tradition of the Crusades or the Counter Crusades or, um, uh, again, in Europe, uh, in European history, the history of France begins when Charles Martel stopped the Arabs at Poitiers uh, in the uh, Western 8th century. Uh, then there were periodic uh, military, in other words, there were, there's a whole history of military interaction between the Arabs and the Muslims and the, and the European West. Sicily and Italy. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is very positive. There were a lot of cultural exchanges, but there were military engagements, fighting, and particularly with the Crusades and the Counter Crusades and the Ottoman presence in Europe, occupying a good portion of the Balkans, threatening Vienna. So Europe has a, a very long history of period of fairly regular combat with the Muslim world, which led to any number of fears and representations, negative. The United States was spared that. We didn't exist in that time. Mm -hmm. We were a country without a, a long history. We were a country without a, a, a sort of medieval tradition. Sure, we were settled by people who came from Europe, but it's almost as if they left their memories behind. You know, there are no scenes of battles. And I think, I think most of the Americans at the time of establishing America, they, did, they had uh, certain negative ideas about Europe. They didn't like yes, they certain were, points for in, them, Europe in their was communities. Exactly. Yeah. For them, Europe and its whole historic experience was something they were fleeing from. They wanted to establish a new world. And they were focused on the present and the future, not the past. And they were fleeing from the very societies that had, were deeply involved in these contests. So the American attitude was actually very positive, almost romantic. Books were Washington Irving, a very popular American author, Mark Twain, others, all wrote very positively about the Arab world and the Muslim world, particularly about Muslim Spain. Mm -hmm. Washington Irving's stories about Andalusia, he was writing positively about Muslim Spain at a time when if you went to Spain, no one would talk about this, as if it never existed. Muslim Spain, with all, even though their cultural heritage of Spain yes. is Islamic, yes. and today they acknowledge most it. Most of the languages, so much is of, even much Arabic. Much of Spanish is derived from mm -hmm. many of the vocabulary, mm -hmm. not the language, but the vocabulary. Yeah. Yeah. Hundreds of words in the Spanish vocabulary are derived from Arabic, even in French and English, via the Romance languages. Words like rice, alcohol, whatever, scientific words, agricultural words, military words, even the word admiral. Mm -hmm is derived from uh, the Romans encountering the, uh, in Palermo and the Normans who conquered uh, Sicily. So anyway, there, was no, there wasn't this prejudice, and if anything, it was a popular image. In America, what changes everything is the, um, the rise of the State of Israel. Mm -hmm. With the State of Israel uh, and its uh, success triumph in 1948, 
and then its um, tremendous military success in 56, when it joined with France and England in the uh, aggression against Egypt, yes. and it had a great military success. Politically, it wasn't a success because President Eisenhower forced them to reach, and the Soviet Union forced them to uh, retreat mm -hmm. and return the Sinai. But they had a great military. With that, simultaneously from 1943 on, the, Ameri the international Zionist movement had decided that America was the future, not England. Remember, most of the energies of the Zionist movement and looking for alliances were with England. Mm -hmm. From 19, from before, during World War One on, when they secured the Balfour Declaration and promised England that that would bring yes. them the support of, of Jewry in the, in the world, all through the 20s and 30s. By 1943, the Zionist movement convened in a, a meeting in New York, it was called at the Hotel Biltmore, where they, they specifically made the decision that America would now be the center of their activities. Because you had a, a well-established, accepted, and, and rising American Jewish community that was becoming very powerful, very rich, mm. had very little interest in Zionism. But they were gonna make it interesting. In other words, it wasn't that the American Jewry was all pro-Israeli or pro-Zionist. Um, quite the contrary. You emigrated to America because you believed religiously, you know, like let's say if you go back to the late 19th century when millions of Jews immigrated to America from Russia, Hungary, Poland, they immigrated there instead of to Palestine because they wanted freedom and opportunity. And their religion at that time told them not to immigrate to Palestine. The Orthodox religion told them in the 19th century that they were in exile and they had no business going to Palestine. And Zionism in its start was not a religious movement. It was very secular, almost atheist, you know? Because uh, Orthodox, now that's changed now, but at that time, Orthodox religion was anti-Zionist. So the Zionist movement had to work very hard, and they worked very hard. Look, in 1948, for instance, take Hollywood. Most of the Hollywood, their books have been published. Most of the Hollywood, uh, big time Hollywood uh, directors, not directors, the, the producers, producers, the owners of the yeah. studios, who were Jewish, did not give money to Israel. They were very worried. They said, maybe the American, our fellow Americans will think we have dual loyalties. They were very worried about this. Uh, American sentiment was not overwhelming. You know, America almost went back on the partition decision. People don't realize in 1948, America was not, by no means, was in the solid in the Zionist camp. But already the Israelis had worked from 43 to 48, developing in the Jewish community developing, working hard. I mean, you know, when I mean working hard, publishing books, articles, uh, spending millions of dollars. Money yeah, spending it. millions of dollars to invite Jewish intellectuals to visit Palestine and see the things they have accomplished, the kibbutzes they had built, the this, the that. They worked very hard. They are very they were a modern Western political mass movement. Just like the Socialist Party or the Conservative Party or the Communist Party or the Fascist. They were and they were a revolutionary movement. They worked very hard. So by 48, they already had the sympathy. Now, there's a second thing you have to remember, the Holocaust, mm -hmm. okay? The Holocaust is real. It really happened, very tragic. The and they used The it. Palestinians shouldn't have had to pay the price for the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And President Roosevelt came to understand that. Unfortunately, he understood it just a few months before he died when mm -hmm. King Saud explained it to him, said, look, if they should get, if the Jews, Jewish refugees could, should get a state, because of the Holocaust, the land should be taken from the Germans, the other ones yeah. that did it to them. <laughs> and Roosevelt said, yes, that's logical. But the point was, Roosevelt died shortly afterwards. But the Holocaust was real. And to deny it, as happens so often in Arab media, is as long as you do that, you will never understand why the West supported Israel. Mm -hmm. Because of this tremendous guilt they felt. Yeah. Now, but, all you but, can say... But they, ah, they used yes, the guilt That's what they're saying. The all Western you media. can say about the Holocaust is that the Holocaust was real, but then the Zionists went ahead, movement, and manipulated it, used it, used it to generate guilt over and over and over and over and over and over again. But that doesn't mean it wasn't real. And, and especially 1944, that had an impact on many American Jews. They said when they saw the, the films that came out of the concentration camps, mm -hmm. and these weren't Zionists who were doing it, this was the American and British Army who liberated these camps, and the Russians, and they saw this and learned about it, it had an effect on them. So that made them vulnerable to Zionist propaganda. Because mm -hmm. the Zionists would say, the, the, okay, the Jews in America, they're secure, but the Jews elsewhere, they're insecure. They need a home of their own. And what does an American know about Palestine? They were told there was nobody there. They were told 
the slogan of the Zionist movement is this is a land without a, a land without a people for a people without a land. A land without a people. How, how do they explain it? But the point way? is, in 1948, you can get away with it. You don't have satellite television, you don't yes, have anything. Yes. Who's covering it? Maybe a few. So they reinforce that. They would take people uh, to tour. They wouldn't take them to the. They wouldn't take them to Jaffa. Or in 1948, 49, if they took American intellectuals to Jaffa, they'd see the orange groves. They'd say to them, "And we're lucky. This happened to me. I was really? yes. I, I, it happened not in Jaffa. It happened in Latrun. Yeah. My parents came to visit when I was living uh, for a year under the occupation because I was the managing editor of Jordan's English language newspaper in Arab mm -hmm. Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So I was there for the 67 war and I stayed for one year working as a foreign correspondent. My parents came and they went out on a standard tour. We're driving through the Latrun salient, which had been captured by the Israelis in 48. Yes. It was one of the most lush agricultural areas. And the driver, the, 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 the taxi driver, starts to tell, who's a tour guide, starts telling my parents, this was all desert before the Zionist movement. What are my parents done? I said, sure, uh, I'm there, so I They believed the, him. They believed him, why not? He's a nice boy, young yeah. man driving. He said, this was all desert. We turned it. I said, they cultivated said, the I said, land? I said, no. This was one of the richest agricultural areas in Palestine. And this was captured in 48. And he said, no, no, no. And I said, the proof is, I said, wherever you see a circle of Sabra, you know, the Sabra, the... Yes. Uh, I said, you know there was a Palestinian village there. And I said, if we drove around the salient, we'd probably find 50 of them. Because this whole salient had many villages which were destroyed. All that remains are the Sabra trees. They weren't mm -hmm. torn down, you know? Mm -hmm. But the other tour, how would they know? How would the American Jews know? They bought that slogan. And meanwhile, they worried, oh, what are we going to do with all these Jews from Europe? And the Zionist movement very cleverly prevented the American... Roosevelt was ready to admit hundreds of thousands of Jewish refugees. Most of the Jewish refugees in Europe who survived the Holocaust, they got out of the camps, they wanted to go to America, mm. land of opportunity. But they didn't want them They there. weren't allowed to. Zionist lobby moved influence, played on the fears. They played on the fears of the American Jewish community. They'll say, if all these people come to America, there'll be anti-Semitism, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, they played on the fears of the Christians. You want all these Jews here, you know? This is a Christian <laughs> country. They played on everybody's fears and prevented Roosevelt from, oh, he was gonna open up for half a million, a million, whatever. So in the end, that was it. So the, then by 19, after 56, we get a changed attitude. The Jews realize Israel's now popular. They're the heroic little state that's resisting. They're not gonna get in trouble with their fellow Americans. Um, in 1948, all the American ambassadors warned the United States and say, if we support Israel, we're gonna lose our support in the Arab world. Well. For domestic political reasons, they President agreed. Truman switched positions and supported it. He was ready to go, you know, America was shifting away from partition. No, he brought it back. For domestic, you get the Jewish vote. And what happened? Nothing. American influence did not decline. It increased. Because the Arab political leadership was very naive. Somehow they still thought that Britain was the enemy. Well, mm -hmm. that may have been true 20 years earlier, but no longer. Britain, by 48, was a friend. They were trying mm -hmm. to hold on. Mm -hmm. But they turned to America. So America's influence increased despite its support for Israel. So the American government said, hey, we can have it both ways. We can support Israel and make the American Jewish community politically happy and still have influence here, increasing influence here mm -hmm. in the Arab world. So that's what happened. So now Hollywood movies, now you had a movie like Exodus. Meanwhile, all the hard work they did, the Jewish lobby, and the uh, Zionist movement, getting writers to come, paid off because the older generation that had experienced the Holocaust was open to that. What do they know? What does a European and an American who, who was an adult at the time of World War II know about the Palestinians? All he knew was that the leader of the Palestinians, Hajimin Husseini, went to Berlin where he was with Hitler. Mm -hmm. So as far as they're concerned, and recruited an SS battalion, which you can be sure the Israel lobby spread all over America and yeah. Europe, that the leader of the Palestinians was side by side with Hitler, broadcasting for Hitler and recruiting a special battalion of Palestinians to serve with the SS. Since Hitler was the enemy, they said, oh, so the Palestinians are Nazis. So everything worked against the Palestinians. And the few people who dared to speak out by 1965, in the 1950s, the lobby was so powerful that they could start to crush, okay? Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. I was in 1967, I was in Jordan. 
I was the editor of Jordan's English language newspaper. I saw the fall of Jerusalem. I stayed on for one year to work for the New York Times, uh, covering the occupied territories. Then I went to Amman to do my book, The Fall of Jerusalem, because all the people in my book had been kicked out of the occupied territories, expelled by the Israelis, the mayor of Jerusalem, the political leadership. So to do my book, I left, and also was getting personally a bit tense. So I went to Amman, continued to work for the New York Times, but I did mm -hmm. my book. My book, I, I was an, a fairly well-known young author in America. When I said I was going to do a book, I was given an advance by a publishing house. I knew all the editors. When I finally finished the book, and big campaigns had started, the publisher gave me the advance, his banker spoke to him. Right? He said, no. can't do it. The book went to another publishing house. I knew the senior editor. He confessed to me, this is the first book I wanted that I've never been able to get through. It was stopped by my publisher. His publisher personally stopped the book. Mm -hmm. Between 1967 and 1973, there was a virtual, you know, in the end, I had to go to an obscure publishing house. And even they couldn't get it distributed in England, except through the Bertrand Russell Foundation, because their distributor was Jewish. He said, I'd like to, but my synagogue, I'll be ostracized if I handle it. There was a campaign by the, by the Israeli government and uh, the, to stop my book from being circulated. It That's because around. it had uh, the truth. Because I told the story of the, the 67 war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what happened? And I told the history of Palestine in my book. I told the history. I said, my book, the, I said, the, the fall of Jerusalem only took five days. But the siege has been going on since 1917. That's how I begin my book. And then I tell the story of the siege. Yes. How Arab Jerusalem has been under siege since 1917. You know, the whole history of the Zionist conquest of Palestine. So everything was done. The New York Times commissioned someone to review it. Buttons were pulled, it was killed, okay? Now, I'm happy, I have good news. That atmosphere is no longer the case. Mm -hmm. Today, oh, Hollywood movies. Terrible Hollywood movies were made, and still are, in which the terrorists are always Arabs or yes. Muslims. Yes, yes. Okay? Now, I'm happy to say that in the last 10, 15 years, starting with 1973, the 73 war, and a new generation, young generation coming up, Things have changed. Today, the Israel lobby is very powerful, but it's powerful purely because of money. Mm -hmm. Because it can use its money not just, in other words, besides this one or two states where the Jewish vote is very central, right? Very central, like New York and California. It can use its money because of the way American campaigning, we, we, if there's, someone once said, if there's ever campaign reform, the Israel lobby's finished. Mm -hmm. Right now, if so, a senator is running for, for office in Wyoming, I just made that state up, yeah. <laughs> for which there are almost no Jews at all. Uh -huh. And that senator has been known for being even-handed, you know, even-handed on the Arab yeah. Israeli. The Israel lobby can pump millions of dollars from out of state, money they raise in New York and California, and they can put it into that campaign to defeat him. And they did that. In the 80s and 90s, they knocked out Paul McCluskey, congressman from California, very even-minded, Republican, very fair. One of the reasons why the Republican Party is so pro-Israeli is all the others have been knocked out mm -hmm. by funding. They didn't have to worry about the Democratic Party because the Democratic Party was always pro-Israeli. Yeah, so but the Republican they are, Party. So they are precise. So they have power to work on this. Oh yeah, they're very thoughtful and precise. And they took money they raised in New York and California and knocked out Senator Percy in Illinois. Senator Percy was the senior Republican. Senator Percy. Uh, uh, was head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and he was very fair-minded, you know. He, he believed in equal treatment between the Arabs and the Israelis, and America being committed to a fair and just peace settlement. He was knocked out. They pumped millions of dollars into his campaign, and he was knocked out of, and deprived of the Republican nomination, or defeated in the election. They did it to McCluskey, they did it to Congressman Finley, they did it to Percy. They've done it to others. So the Republican Party, all the key figures who knew about the Middle East and who were fair-minded, uh, were defeated with his, his Israeli lobby money. Now that's their power, the power of the Israel lobby. But in many other areas, they don't have the power that they used to. What yeah. about the media? How can the Arab media play a role in this? Uh, well, the first thing is, if... is it's got to recognize that it, it, it tries to be as factual as possible if it addresses. It, first of all, it has to address the Americans in English. The Americans don't know Arabic. If you speak in Arabic, you're, you're addressing the, the people who converted. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I think it's fine for the, for the American Arab immigrants who still speak Arabic, but their children don't. So um, we have to be speaking in English. But by speaking in English, we have to, the speaking should be done by Western Muslims, by British and American Muslims. And I mean people born there, people who have the culture, who understand. I was part of a project in the United States to build a mosque and a um, school in New Mexico. We did it. We built a mosque. At the same time, 400 miles away, a group of Arab students were building, opening a mosque. At the same time. To our mosque in New Mexico, we had a representative of the governor come, we had the local priests come, we had people from the Protestant churches come, we had everybody there. It was a celebration, right? The same week, the mosque that was opened by Arab students in America, they complained very bitterly that the only non-Muslims who came, despite all the invitations, was the contractor who made money from them. Why? Because you cannot point the finger at people and say, you're a coffer, you're dirty coffers, you know, you drink, you do this, you do that. First, you can't do it because the Quran tells us not to do it. God says, speak nicely, speak with grace. Speak nicely and with grace to people. But these students, Connie, for 300 days a year, they would go around saying, you're oh, 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 in a university, you're coffers, you're dogs, you're prostitutes, you're this, you're that, and then expect them to come to the mosque. We didn't speak like that. We're fellow Americans. We addressed our fellow Americans. Please, you know, Islam is a religion. Do you know that we believe in the Virgin Mary? Say, Damarium is very important to us. Say, Nais, if we're talking to Christians, mm -hmm. to the Jews, do you know that Say, Namus is very important? You know, come and visit the mosque. See, what a difference. We had everybody come. The governor, they were happy. The priest, the priest even gave a, a, a sermon the following week to his people saying, you should be like the Muslims. They don't beat their wives. They don't drink and get drunk, you know? So part of it is why it's so important that it be Westerners, Western Muslims, who share the same culture and history and could understand what could be terribly offensive. And they're the ones who should do the news stories and explain what is happening, you know, and explain, uh, uh, report the news factually and according to the, st there's a, a style of reporting which we have, it's an international standard. And, and so I think that's very important. There should be media campaigns, but they should be managed by either Arab Americans, who could be Christian or Muslim, or British and American Muslims, mm -hmm. native born, from the culture, yeah. and really who've been educated. I'm not talking about someone whose parents are immigrants, so they have no education, but who are graduates of American universities. And who, like we did 20 years ago, in New Mexico, in the state of New Mexico in the United States, could open a mosque and get all our neighbors to come. Because the American people are basically very decent people. You know, when this business happened, with, when, when, it, when it became clear, you know, very, very shortly, uh, the danger of September 11th, and President Bush went into the mosque and gave a, said we were not, okay. Yes. Do you know, all over America, women were escorting you. Christian women, some even Jewish women, were escorting Muslim women to the supermarket. Some of them even put on a gab. They had a day of a gab, but they all, never got reported here because mm -hmm. everybody here wants to be anti-American. But thousands of American Muslim, American non-Muslim women put on the hagab one day as a show of solidarity for the American women who were being, you know, insulted. And we never had, you know, and, and, and some mosques that were threatened were defended. People from the local churches and synagogues came and defended them. That should have been reported here, and it wasn't. So part of it also is to, to understand the good in America as well as the bad. The bad is obvious. But to understand the good, the infinite good, we have had none of the... I think it's mutual. It's mutual. Both, both Very good. Uh, people should and understand I think the, it's the, the Ameri positives it's and the negatives American, of the It's the American culture. Muslim and the Arab American who can be that bridge for both sides. All right. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Before we end, there is one thing that we should remember, that if there is a negative image on Arabs and Muslims all over the world or in certain Western parts of the world, there is responsibility on the Arab mass media, on the Arab channels, the Arab uh, magazines, the Arab newspapers, and there is a responsibility also on us Arabs and Muslims. We have to explain our case fairly and truthfully and sincerely. And there is another responsibility also on us Arabs and Muslims, and that is to set the example. And first of all, to understand Islam, the essence of Islam, and uh, work within its frame and prove it whenever we deal with any Western person or with 
each other as Muslims and Arabs. Thank you very much.